So we are in a series right now, moving into the message, we are in a series right now entitled Second Priority, and we're looking at uh, the family. How many of you have enjoyed this series so far? Anyone at all? Man, I pray, I felt the Lord really convict us in the beginning of the year that we really need to set aside this time in the fall to talk about our families, to talk about marriages, and that we said in week one that we would make God what? Our first priority. And in making God our first priority, we would look at every single message and all of our lives in the lens of making God what? Our first priority. So that's what we want to do. We want to make God our first priority. We're concluding this message series next week. Many of you have been in marriage small groups as well. And the really culmination of this series and small groups is Friday night. It is our fight night. What we've been saying, that we're going to, on this night, we're going to learn not to fight with our spouse, but what, for our spouse. And so I want to encourage you that uh, if you were married in this room and, you, uh, and if you can attend, please come out Friday night. You can find a sign up online. And I believe that the Lord is really going to move and work in marriages even more so than what he has. I've heard many testimonies of God just uh, healing marriages and bringing them close together than they ever have before. So man, come out for that night uh, and make sure you sign up for it. It is $50 and I just wanna say this, if you can't afford it for some reason, at all, please let us know and we will get you in the door. There's no worries whatsoever. We'll take care of it. So please let us know that. So this message this morning, we're talking about pursuit. We're talking about pursuit. We, Man, this morning we pursued the Lord in worship. Our one pursuit is him. And as we pursue him, we also want to do what? We want to pursue our spouse. So my prayer for you is if you're here this morning and you were not married, that this morning you would be uh, given tools so that when God does bring that special person into your life, that you'll have the tools to make that relationship successful. For those of you who are married, that this morning that you would, as we look at God's word, that you would be encouraged, lifted up, that you would begin to have a marriage that is strengthened through this word this morning, in a way that it's really never been before. If, it, if it's good now, it'll be better. If you're on the brink of disaster, so to speak, that the Lord will come in and heal your marriage relationship. And that's my prayer for you this morning as we talk about pursuing our spouse. And so the, message, the title of my message this morning is Pursuit. If you like the notes uh, of what's in front of me, you can text notes to the number that's on the screen. And what's in front of me will be in front of you. Let's pray right now and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for this morning, God. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to gather together. Lord, we don't gather around anything else other than you. We're not here to make ourselves feel good. We're not here to make a checkbox off the list, God. But, Lord, we're just here for you. And so, Holy Spirit, I just pray that, God, that you would just use me as your mouthpiece as I humble myself before you, God. Because I know that, Lord, without you, without your spirit, God, Lord, my words are empty. And so, Father, I pray that, God, you would take your written word, your logos word, that, God, you would make it alive in our hearts, God. You would make it rhema to us. So, God, we just say to you this morning, would you speak to us, God? Speak to us for your servants are listening. Lord, we love you, we bless you, and we thank you. And everyone said this morning, amen, amen, amen. I want to start off with a question this morning. How many of you have ever made a fool of yourself in the name of love? You know, some crazy over-the-top things in the name of love. Some people have said to me before, Adam, you outpunted your coverage when you married Laura. Adam, you married way, 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 way up. And I would attest to that. I absolutely married way, way, way up. I saw her for the first time. I was like, man, I want to pursue her and get to know her. There's, here's the thing about pursuit. We pursue what we don't yet have. We pursue what we don't yet have. When I, when I first... Um, saw Laura, it was when I was 20 years old. We were at a, uh, 
uh, at a wedding. And I still remember to this day, she was wearing a red dress. And I remember her smile. She was a bridesmaid. And I remember her smile and her dimples. And I was like, man, I really got to talk to her. I never had talked to her before. And so after the wedding was over, we had mutual friends and we started talking and I quickly realized through even hanging out that night as I kind of strategically gathered the rest of my friends around and got us all together to hang out, including her, that her personality met her looks and I was deeply, all of a sudden, just had this huge crush on her. (laughs) Yeah, come on Jesus, you ever felt that way before? But along the way, with this feeling that I had inside, uh, my friends made my pursuit of my spouse really, really awkward. So a couple of things as they found out that I liked her was uh, my roommate. Uh, he was, was crazy. I, I don't know what he was thinking. We went out. We hung out one night. It was uh, him and Laura. We went somewhere else and myself and we went to go meet some other friends and we came back home uh, to, to uh, where my, myself and my roommate was living. She was living at home with uh, her parents still. And uh, we get out of the car and my roommate looks up at the stars and he goes, man, it's a beautiful night out here. You guys stay out here and smooch and I'm going inside a little bit and hang out. And I was like, man, bro, thanks a lot. You're leaving me hanging. This is super awkward right now. And we just laughed it off and kept going. Uh, I remember one time after church, uh, we, were, we were praying, about to pray for our, our food. And, uh, you know, we were all getting around and we're about to pray for our food and we all start holding hands. And everyone, she's on the other side of, of, of the circle and everybody starts switching around in the circle. <laughs> Y'all, we're 20 years old. Like we're not, we're not kids. They start switching around the circle just to get us to hold hands. And so they made it super awkward for us. And so it took some time for me to kind of ask her out. And so finally, I kind of devised a plan and I asked my sister, she was managing uh, this business called the, the Counter Club. I remember, I don't know if you remember those in, in the mall. Uh, and I asked her, hey, can you, I know Laura's looking for some extra work around Christmas time because it's only a seasonal business, looking for extra work around Christmas time. Can you hire her and hire me and we'll both work. And I want you to also put us on the same schedule at the same time. And so I devised this plan to get over the awkwardness, and she, uh, she put Laura and I on the same schedule at the same time. Yo, I was not good with girls. I'll go ahead and tell you right now. I was not good. It was a good thing probably in a way. And, and so we got on the same time, kind of overcame the awkwardness. And so instead of being able to tell her how I felt to her face, I decided, okay, I'm just going to write her a note, write her a letter, and I'm going to bring her flowers. And she was, um, we lived in, at the time in Somerville, South Carolina. She had another job down in West Ashley. It was about 35, 40 minutes away. So I drove down one night when she was working late at the mall. Um, I think she was working at Verizon maybe. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. And I dropped off um, flowers and the note to her of how I felt because I couldn't tell her in person. Uh, that night, she, uh, this is when texting just first came out, and she texts me and just says, thank you so much. And through that pursuit of her, I uh, was able to finally ask her out on a date, and man, you know, the rest was history. The rest was history. We tend to pursue things that we don't yet have. You know what I'm saying? We tend to pursue things that we don't yet have. And in our pursuit, oftentimes, we do some crazy, over-the-top, outlandish things. Maybe for some of you in this room, you, you lived up north and you decided, okay, I'm going to uh, drive two hours in the snow just to spend 15 minutes with that special someone. Maybe for you, you were younger, you had no money, you decided to empty out your savings account and take them to their, the, 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 your, your, the favorite concert in which you don't even like them. You, you, you took them on a date and empty out your savings account. Maybe uh, for you, you just did some things that were crazy, outlandish. We do some things over the top in the name of love. Anybody else ever done that before? What happens though one day when we wake up and we feel like, man, I've lost the love. I've lost the romance, the adventure's gone. My feelings towards that person is gone. 
Well, I'll go ahead and tell you right now that as we're talking about our second priority, what probably has happened is you've gotten your priorities out of line. You've stopped pursuing God as your number one and you've stopped pursuing your spouse as your number two. And so you've gotten some priorities out of line and you wake up one day and you feel like, man, I don't really feel the romance. I don't really feel the connection that I once had with my spouse. How come we think that in our marriage relationships oftentimes that we don't have to do anything to keep it healthy. When we know that if we want a healthy body, what we have to do? We have to eat right, we have to exercise, right? If we want a business that thrives, what do we have to do? We have to watch over our financials, we have to pour into our staff in order for it to be healthy. How about our grass? <laughs> If you want green grass that grows and not weeds in your grass, what do you have to do? You have to fertilize it and you have to water it. In your marriage relationship, if you ever feel like the grass is greener on the other side, I'm here to tell you this morning, water your own grass. Fertilize your own grass. Don't look outside of the marriage, man. Fertilize and water your own grass. If you ever feel like, man, the grass is greener somewhere else, Put some effort in in pursuit of your spouse. In Genesis, it says this, Genesis 2, 24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is what? Say it out loud. And is united to his wife and they become what? One flesh. A man leaves his father and mother. He reprioritizes his relationship. God is number one. His spouse is number two. And he's united to his wife. This Hebrew word for united is this word debak. Debak. Debak means this to cling or adhere, to catch by pursuit, to pursue hard with affection and devotion. Debak. They were united as one flesh. In fact, uh, let me show you three different ways that this Hebrew word is used in Scripture. Psalm 63 8. It says this, I follow close, so that word follow close is that word debak, I follow close behind you. Now that's also a stalker's favorite verse as well. <laughs> but that's another message. Joe 41, 17, they join fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Judges 20, 45, they pursued hard after them. That word debak, they pursued hard. They were united, they were debak, they pursued hard after one another, and therefore they became what? They became one flesh. They became one flesh. One of my uh, favorite stories uh, when it comes to relationship in the Bible is the story of Rachel and Leah. It says, the, the Bible's incredible. It's, it's super funny sometimes. It says about Rachel that she had a lovely figure. And it says, literally it says this in scripture. She had a lovely figure. And it says about, about Leah, she had weak eyes. <laughs> weak eyes meaning she had a good personality. Uh, <laughs> and Jacob, she, he wanted, he wanted Rachel. He wanted to pursue Rachel. So he asked Rachel and Leah's father, he asked, uh, can I marry Rachel? And Laban, his, his father, said, uh, yes, but you've got to work for seven years. You've got to work for seven years. And so uh, Jacob, he worked for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, uh, Laban pulled one over on Jacob. This is in Genesis 29. La- uh, uh, he pulled one over on, on Jacob and, and gave him Leah instead of Rachel. And he says, whoa, 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 whoa. I, didn't, I didn't want Leah. I wanted Rachel. And so Laban said to him, I'll go ahead and give you Rachel, but you got to work for another seven years. So he went ahead and gave him Rachel after this, but he had to work for her for another seven years. I love this because this is incredible imagery of how the Lord, I think, really wants us to, to live in our relationships with our spouse, that we should work and continue to work after in pursuit after we're already married. The pursuit doesn't stop once you get married. 
We got to continue to work. We got to continue to pursue even after we've been married. We should always pursue what? Our second priority. They were united and they became one flesh. What happens when you're dating and you're pursuing each other? You, you do everything you possibly can to get that person. What happens though is if you don't continue to pursue in your marriage, things tend to go down. And so I just want to say this. If, if, if you're not married this morning and you're in a relationship and the pursuit is not equal, you're pursuing them more than they're pursuing you, I just want to say to you this morning, you need to reevaluate that relationship. Here's the thing about this. You are a son and daughter of God. And some of you need to hear this in this room this morning. You are a son and daughter of God, and you are worth the pursuit. You are worth the pursuit, and you are valuable to God. You are valuable to God, and you are worth being pursued after I recently took my daughter, she's 12 years old, on a date. This is about three weeks ago. And I've never really had done this before with her, but I uh, wanted to show her chivalry, right? So I opened the door for her wherever we went. And so when we left to go on our daddy-daughter date, uh, we were, went to Outback. And as we were getting in the car, even leaving the house, I opened the door for her. I get in the car and I say to her, Ruth, I want you to know something. When you were 20 years old and you start dating, <laughs> you've got to know that if he is not opening the door for you, if he is not pursuing you, you need to drop him like it's hot. <laughs> Get rid of that boy. Because you are worth pursuing. And she says to me, Dad, he doesn't need to open the door for me. I can open the door myself. I said, no, Ruth. You need someone who understands your value and your worth. Do not settle for anyone else. And so the entire night, we went to Outback. We got cheese fries and, and ranch dressing because cheese fries are Outback, y'all. They're very, very good. And the ranch dressing goes along with it. And it is amazing. We left there. I opened the door for her. I gave her the same spill again. And she says, Dad, I don't need a boy to open the door for me. I said, yes, you do. I took her to get uh, ice cream that night and just opened the door for her and loved on her the entire night. And I wanted to show her what a gentleman looked like. And I just want you to know this, that you were worth pursuing after. You were worth pursuing after. And dads, I just want to encourage you, as your daughters grow up, show them their worth. Show them and let them understand their worth so that one day when they do begin to date, they're not going to settle for some just old guy. They're going to pursue for God's best in their life. That even already we would begin to, as parents, we begin to pray, intercede for the spouses of our kids. Because God does have somebody perfect for them. Amen? So we continue to pray in, pers in, in, in pursuit as, as they go into these, these new years. Because we live in challenging times, don't we? Yes, sir. We live in challenging times. They need to understand what healthy relationships look like. And none of us enter into a marriage relationship and think, man, I, I don't want it to work out. When none of us enter into a relationship and think seven years down the road, I want to split up all of our assets and they'll take the kids on the weekend and I'll take the kids during... The, the, during the week, none of us go into a relationship like that. But often what happens is this. Often what happens is our intentions don't line up with our actions. We intend to do something in our marriage relationships, but we don't act on it because of tiredness, because of weariness, because of life in general. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give you three principles, three principles to close the gap between our intentions and our actions. If you're ready this morning, say, let's go. Come on, say, let's go. So number one here this morning, when you want to say something good, just say it. When you want to say something good to your spouse, just say it. Don't hold it back from them. Every time you think something good of your spouse, say it. Hebrews 3.13 says this, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by the sins of deceitfulness. A couple pieces of advice for us. Let me, uh, let me talk first to 
the men in this room. Gentlemen, when you pursue her with words, pursue her with words of affection. Pursue her with words of affection. Don't pursue her with, uh, with sexual affection. Pursue her with non-sexual affection. Words of non-sexual affection. And so what do we do? We say this. We say, I love you because of blank, right? I love you because of whatever it might be. So every single day you think back, you say, okay, when you think of something good about your spouse, I love you because you're a wonderful mom, right? Words of affection. I love you because, man, you're my absolute best friend. I love you because I know that we're committed to one another no matter what. I'm committed to you and you're committed to me. I love you because, man, you serve me and you serve me so selflessly and thank you so much for all that you do for our family. I love you because, gentlemen, pursue her with words of affection. Ladies in this room, pursue him with words of affirmation. This is so important. Pursue him with words of affirmation. I just want to encourage you. Try not to tell him what he's not. What do you do? Because that's defeating for a man. You pursue him with words of affirmation. When you say, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not this, you're not that, all it does to your man is he tears him down. Pursue him with words of affirmation. If he's not quite there, when you build him up, he'll grow into the man that you want him to become. Build him up with words of affirmation because the way you see him really does help determine who he will become. You know, when, when Laura, she builds me up, when she speaks words of affirmation to me, not words that are tearing me down, but words of affirmation, man, I feel like I can conquer the world. I feel like, man, any, anything that I'm encountering in life, it's okay because I've got someone by my side who believes in me. So ladies, pursue him with words of affirmation. Ephesians 4.29 says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Ladies, pursue him with words of affirmation. Men, pursue her with words of affection. Men, she wants to know this. Do you love me today? She wants to know, do you love me today? Ladies, he wants to know, do you believe in me today? Do you believe in him today? So anytime you think something good, say it. The second thought is this. When you want to do something special, just do it. When you want to do something special, just do it. Every time, any time you think, man, I want to do something special for that person, just do it. James 4.17 says this. I just want to loosely apply this to marriage. And if we do, it can be really convicting. It says this. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, what is it? It is sin for them. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Any time that you know something good that you should do to be a blessing to your spouse, man, just do it. Maybe for you, uh, you're going to leave work early. You're going to come home and you're going to say, hey, let's go for a walk. Maybe for you, you'll leave work early you'll see, and you'll come home and you'll say, hey, let's, let's go out on a, on a date tonight. Maybe uh, for, for you in, in your pursuit after your spouse and you think of something good to do, you come home and you realize, man, my wife is wiped out. You have young kids. What are you going to do? You're going to take your young kids and you're going to uh, give them a bath. There's nothing more romantic, y'all, than sometimes giving your young kids a bath. Or maybe it's cleaning the dishes, doing the laundry and folding it for them, right? Amen, Amen my wife said. It just keeps piling up over and over and over and over again. I don't do that very often. Maybe I should. Maybe for you, amen, again, I like that. Uh, maybe for you, you'll send your spouse, your wife, flowers. And this is one thing that I've learned about sending my wife flowers is that if I send my wife flowers while she's, other, she's around other women, it just multiplies the effort right there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> A little tip for you, gentlemen. Send her flowers at work while she's other around, around other people. When you think of something good to do for your spouse, just do it. Sometimes we get lazy and we're like, man, I really want to do it, but then 
our intentions don't really line up with our actions, just do it. So what are we going to do? We're going to, if we have something good we want to say, we're going to say it. If you think something special, just do it. Number three, third thing I want to give you this morning is when you want something that's different, just be it. When you want something in your relationship that is different than what you're getting, just be it. You being an example to your spouse can change them drastically, but you've got to be patient. Sometimes it takes time. That's why you must live out Psalm 1914. It says this. May these words of what? Of my, my mouth, and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. When you want something different, be it. Examine your own heart and allow the Lord, his spirit, to correct you. A lot of you, and I often do this too, you point fingers at your spouse, well, if they do this, then I'll do this. If they start picking up their, their laundry off the floor, then I'll begin to do this. And we always put a, a thing, if they do this, then I'll begin to, no, what do we have to do? We have to be concerned only for ourselves. We can't control other people. We can't even control our spouse. We're not going to criticize our way into a better marriage. Being critical of your spouse is not going to make your marriage better. We're responsible for ourselves. So I want to give you, in closing, two principles. Two principles here. If you don't like what you're getting, look at what you're giving. If you don't like what you're getting in your marriage, look at what you're giving. So instead of complaining about what you're not getting, ask yourself, what can you give to the marriage to allow, always pursue your spouse? You see, there was a time when you did this. You were in love and you pursued your spouse. You can do it again. Why? Because you were crazy about this person. And years later, you wonder why you're not. Somewhere along the way, you stop pursuing them. Continue to pursue them. You already had something special because you did something special. Which leads me to the second principle. To get what you once had, you must do what you once did in your marriage relationship. To get what you once have, had, do what you once did. You had it before, church. You can get it again. You know what to do. You did it once. You know how to do it. You did it before. You can do it again. You look back and remember the romance, the tenderness, the closeness of your relationship. You did it before, you can do it again. You built it before, you can build that closeness again. You did it, then you can do it again. To get what you once had, do what you once did. If it was ever special, church, your relationship, your spouse can be special again. You can be special again. So when Jesus was talking to the church of, in Ephesus, who fell away from me, he said it very simply. And I know this is a different context, but I'd like to re apply this loosely in our marriage relationship. He's a, he's, Jesus says this about the church of Ephesus in verse 5, chapter 2. Remember the height from which you were fallen. Repent. And do the things you did at first. You know how to pursue. Don't waste the gift that God has given you through all these years. My encouragement to you this morning is, man, fall in love with your spouse again. And again, this is really the heart of the series, is that the enemy is attacking marriages. Because if he can break apart that one relationship... He can ruin the nuclear family in general. Like, and so I just really felt a conviction. Again, like the Lord was just kind of drawing us into this time of just really getting these marriage relationships shored up because then kind of everything else just kind of falls into place as we put God first and we put him second or put our spouse second. Put God first, put our spouse second. Everything else just kind of falls into line. And so as we're kind of wrapping up this series, my encouragement to you is just do the practical things. This is a really practical message. Just do the practical things to draw you closer to your spouse again. You did it once, you can do it again. You did it once, you can do it again. Would you rise with me over this room?